this segment, we're going to talk about the what, why, when, and how of multi-hull surveying and what it means to survey a multi-hull boat. So John, I'm just going to let you begin to talk about what it means to do a survey or why somebody would want to survey a multi-hull or any boat for that matter. Well, I should probably start out by saying that I've been in the multi-hull business for 41 years. Uh, I just surveyed uh, uh, my old Sea Runner 37 that I built 41 years ago and it, and it drives home uh, very much why um, you know, surveyors uh, form a portion of this, of this, this whole industry. People don't know what a surveyor does or why he does it, and it's because um, basically it's it's required for administrative reasons if you're going to finance a boat or insure it or you have damage that sort of thing. But more than anything else, a surveyor is an advocate for you. A multi-hull is a rather complicated machine. It's sort of a combination between a a house and maybe an airplane or something like that. It has a lot of technology in it that is um, needs to be, you know, uh, put on the boat very specifically with a, a lot of considerations. There are guidelines and standards that need to be followed, and then there's uh, compliance requirements with uh, the Coast Guard and all that sort of. And, and what a surveyor does is. Um, he looks at the boat, inspects it, and uh, and uh, sees how it how it complies with with all of these various requirements. And in the end, I guess the um, the real question is whether the boat is fit to perform the duty for which it was designed. Your boat, you mean, you just talked about surveying your boat from when you had built it several decades ago, and that boat has done several circumnavigations around the globe. Is that true? Well, no, it hasn't done circumnavigation, but uh, I, I did um, race it in Transpac in 1972. Okay. That, I did a number of, uh, of coastal races up and down the California coast, and, uh, and then uh, af after Transpac, um, my wife and I did a, a two-year, 20,000-mile uh, circuit through the South Pacific and returned uh, back to the West Coast. Uh, it has some miles on it, um, and there was some lessons to be learned. But uh, it, and it, and it was a home-built boat. I was very young when I built it, and it, it shows um, the level of understanding of the materials at, at the time. Right. Um, and now we have much better materials to use, so boats uh, nowadays are expected to last a lot longer. But I mean, uh, 41 years, uh, and, the, and the boat is, is still um, able to do ocean passages. It's in good enough condition right now to do ocean passage, passages again. Gee, that's not too bad. Right. No, exactly. That's what I thought I had read about the owner who had it surveyed that he had just got done a very long trip in the boat, very long passage, and then came back to the West Coast, and then I, I thought I saw that the boat was up for sale, and I thought that that's why you may have surveyed it. Yeah, it was finally sold to its third owner mm -hmm. um, after 41 years. The real question here is, uh, is when does a boat owner call a surveyor? Right. Um, and the answer to that is, the day he decides to buy a brand new boat or any type of boat, uh, and a brand new boat is just as important as a used boat. I have surveyed boats on the shipping dock from the manufacturer wow. and found significant deficiencies. Wow, I can't believe that. That was so surprising when you mentioned that to me. You know, most guys having a boat come from the factory, that would be very hard for them to believe that that is the case. Well, the factory's interested in producing boats and getting them out the door. Their quality assurance is probably not up to the level of that of an airplane manufacturer, and so they're probably, you know, pushing the thing out. And oftentimes, their um, their processes and installations and that sort of thing are, are a bit subpar. So, having the boat surveyed on the dock, uh, sure, it adds to the cost of the boat. But that surveyor is probably going to find a significant number of things that will be required to be satisfied by the manufacturer. And at that point, the surveyor is probably paid for himself because otherwise, when that owner turns around and sells that boat, those same deficiencies are going to have to be repaired on his nickel. So it pays. And um, it's a second set of eyes. You know, the installations originally performed on the boat 
were done by technicians in the factory and so forth. And sometimes they are in a hurry to leave on Friday and they might forget something. And the surveyor goes in there and hopefully finds it. And if he does, then, then he's done the sort of work he's supposed to do. What types of deficiencies, without going into too much detail at this point, would you find with a brand new boat on the dock, a multi-haul, as it's you know, waiting for its owner to pick it up? Well, first of all, um, when I survey a boat, what I'm trying to do is assess the soundness of all the surfaces in the boat, and that is the hulls, the, the, the hull bottom, the sides, the, the deck, the joints, the you know cabin and, and installations, that sort of thing. So I, I go over it with a hammer, and it sounds sort of brutal. It's a plastic hammer. Just to sound it like tapping around on an oak door, if there's any... Uh, any softness to the wood, um, it, it makes a different sound. Some surveyors use other non-destructive methods like uh, moisture meters and so forth. Uh, I feel that moisture meters are somewhat difficult to understand and they give an, enough false negatives that um, uh, you know most people that use them spend as much time explaining the false negatives as they do ex explaining the, the, uh, the readings that the thing actually gives that are, that are worthwhile. But uh, most of the boats that I, I survey are wood. The newer ones are, of course, all, all plastic. But um, basically, you're, you're looking for structural soundness. You're looking for compliance with electrical uh, guidelines and standards. Um, you're looking for anything that affects the safety of operation of the vessel, basically. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, if, if, if you're lucky if you get to survey the boat in the rain because it'll show you where the leaks are, which, which may not be evident until, until it does rain. Uh, I found, um, for instance, significant um, gel coat deficiencies on the dock. Uh, mm -hmm. Blisters underneath the gel coat that when I tapped on them, the gel coat just broke away and, and revealed huge, huge blisters, or actually what some surveyors would call never bonds. They were, they were never um, glued together. The, uh, the fiberglass matrix was not pressed down onto the, onto the gel coat finish wow. properly, and there was a, a, a bubble cause there, and it's easy to repair. It's repaired with uh, a, a putty that's the same color as the, as the boat, uh, and then it's, then it's good, but um, that repair might last for, um, for a number of years before something touched it and broke through the gel coat and it would and it would be a you know an expensive repair to have to pull the boat out of the water and, and perform it on on your own expense right exactly um, there are electrical deficiencies due to improvements in the in the electrical specifications over the years for used boats it's very very common a lot of boats had uh, in, in the old days had um, electrical wiring that was um, a, a combination of AC and DC systems. They had shore power coming on board, and the third wire, the green wire in the, in the AC system, was hooked directly to the, the DC ground system in, in the boat, and, and that can be fatal in a number of ways. It means that if there's any mistake uh, or any uh, any problems um, in the in the boat, that the boat might be emitting 110 volts into the water, which can be life-threatening to swimmers. Yes, the boat. exactly. It can also mean that um, any uh, stray currents and so forth um, will cause the zinc anodes protecting underwater metal parts to go away very, very quickly and then start to corrode the metal parts themselves. It can mean potential for shock hazards on board the boat from... Uh, from ungrounded appliances and that sort of thing. So all, all of those are inspections that we look for. The other thing is um, the danger of the boat sinking. I've seen underwater plumbing that really was not fit to be used without somebody standing there watching it all the time. You know, that is hoses connected to through hulls. Wow. There's one manufacturer that uses a, uh, a spiral type hose, generally used in, uh, in in bilge pump systems, that sort of thing, below the water line. And this spiral hose, you can't connect it directly to a hose bar because it, it, it has a texture to it. So they glue it to a rubber cuff on the end, which has a smooth texture so you can fit it down over a hose bar and put clamps on it. Well, sure, you've clamped the cuff there, but this glued-on hose 
is merely glued in place, and it's under pressure with seawater all the time. If that glue should fail, the boat sinks. Wow, and that is something that nobody would think to look at most of the time. Uh, an experienced surveyor would know about that issue, but most boat owners would never know that. Yeah, and the other thing is that the prevalent use of uh, vinyl hoses on boats, which are fine for the water system and so forth, but when they're connected to through-hull fittings below the water line, I, I really don't think they're a good idea. There are no standards against that, but I know for a fact that um, you, can, you can put a piece of vinyl hose on a hose barb, tighten the clamp, and walk away, and tomorrow you can come back and you can pull that hose right off of the hose barb. It, it loosens up. It's, it's, vinyl is not like rubber, which maintains a squeeze onto, onto the hose barb. It, uh, it, it uh, actually cold flows away and loosens up. So we're, we're inspecting to all those, all those sort of things, um, experience plays a, a, a large part in it. Some surveyors are better than others. And all surveyors are not equal. And, uh, and all surveyors do not know about multi-hulls. What anybody wanting to find a surveyor should, is well advised to go um, find one with expertise in multi-hulls um, and ask them um, immediately if, if, they're, if they're a candidate to, and if they don't know anybody, uh, uh, you know, any surveyors or anything like that, they, they, can, um, they can call a surveyor up and say, hey, do you know about multi hills? Do you know about this particular one? What's your experience with them? Blah, blah, blah. And they'll tell you, some surveyors will tell you uh, right off the bat that, uh, gee, I wouldn't even sail one of those things across the middle. <laughs> right. Um, and those are the old guard type guys that came out of the Navy, you know, and they're probably about 80 years old now. Mm -hmm. But the technology is there. multi hulls are an accepted portion of the, of, the, of the establishment yachting scene right now. So, you know, more surveyors are, are, uh, are familiar with these type of boats than have been ever in the past.